Um, do you want to go first? Yeah. Introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I'm um, Emeka and the CTO of Product Health. Um, started there 15 months ago, and we have a team of nine people at the company. And five of them are technical. And um, yeah, I have quite a lot of experience in IT, but I don't think that anything before web counts. So yeah, here you go, that's for me. Very modest. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm Tamara Giltzoff. I'm the VP of Business Development at Product Health, which uh, at this stage of an early stage startup typically means that I spend a lot of time talking to potential customers and trying to understand what their problems are in the marketplace and feeding that into our product development. Um, so that's very much my role. Um, the pressure is on to convert uh, significant amounts more business. <laughs> uh, I come from um, a background of sustainable innovation consulting, so I've been um, very focused in this um, impact world. I've done a lot of work with telcos looking at the intersection of mobile technology and the potential for uh, social and environmental um, and economic impact, um, particularly in developing economies. But um, prior to product health, spent a year working with Telefonica looking at M2M technologies um, and smart home and that type of thing, which led me into um, this little venture in 2012, um, and here we are a few years later. So uh, I'm going to talk through a few kind of intro slides about um, why we care, why we exist, what our purpose is, what we've sort of set out to do, um, and then a little bit of an introduction to product health, and then Emica's going to talk at... Um, an actual kind of case study, our customer, and show you some of the product on the screen, not live. Okay. <laughs> um, so this thing that we call Internet of Things, why do we care about it? There's actually a kind of third circle that's not up there, which I'm going to talk at, but um, we're hugely excited about um, products being able to talk to us. Uh, and we're excited about that because... Um, we see that there's a potential for a circular economy, a cradle-to-cradle -cradle economy where there's much less waste in a supply chain and all the way through that supply chain we can interact with a product to assess whether it's working well to begin with before it's shipped to an end customer or uh, know in advance when it might be failing and preempt maintenance to extend the life of that product or to test how much life is left in that product to evaluate its reuse potential. So that's our... Um, excitement on the left hand side of this slide um, the other area which is happening quite a bit which is networked products so a connection to a product means that you can access that product in a different way so you don't have to necessarily buy and own products anymore you can get access to them and we're seeing the rise of the collaborative economy or the sharing economy happening all around us <coughs> and actually the example that our customer and the sector that we are targeting very much plays into that space because it's dependent on different types of business models to provide access to a product. And kind of the third area, which is around this area, is, is the community enabled around this. So the community that kind of connected products enable, really. Um, and so we're starting to explore what is our community if we are uh, creating data algorithms. Who else? Who's, who's in that community that can make that bigger than the sum of its parts and have the significant impact? we want to have over here. Um, so that's why we care, or what we care about with this technology. Um, yeah, next slide, please. The kind of big macro problem that we're setting out to solve um, in the world, and I've sort of spoken at this a bit already, is that um, 250 years after, roughly, after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've reached uh, significant amounts of waste in our supply chains, uh, peak oil, peak resources in, in many senses, as well as um, products and systems that don't really work anymore with a population heading towards 9 billion people. We can't necessarily all individually own products anymore. And we've ended up with products that we have no idea how they work or how to fix them if they fail, like boilers, which aren't massively sophisticated products. And probably most people in this room do know how to fix a boiler, so <laughs> you're not necessarily my target market, but <laughs> I don't know how to fix a boiler. I'm not an engineer. Um, so that's one of the kind of macro problems that we're trying to solve. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is um, just talking at that circular economy slide a little bit more, where 
we believe intelligence on products starts to have an impact in that supply chain. So I've slightly talked to this already, but assessing the health products before they're shipped, preventing misuse, viewing what's happened to that product, so the history of use of that product to understand why it failed. Was it me using my boiler wrong, or is it a component in the boiler that's um, broken? Um, locating products and identifying components of those products that are failing. Um, so next slide, please. <laughs> um, the second kind of uh, macro trend, I suppose, that we're responding to, or problem that we're responding to, is that there are new markets emerging, and our market that we're, that we're playing into is in developing economies that depend on this type of technology. They don't, they're not having it as a nice-to-have or a value-add, but they're actually depending on this type of technology. So this is the off-grid distributed energy market that is growing at quite a fast rate, in developing economies, um, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, uh, largely small-scale solar systems with a battery unit uh, that are typically sold with a three-year payment plan around it because people, low-income communities, can't necessarily pay for this in cash, but they, they are paying on a daily and weekly basis for kerosene. So if you give these type of customers the opportunity to pay for things over time, they can afford to have clean energy and much better power in their homes than kerosene would provide. Um, so those assets need protecting. You need the ability to turn it on and off if somebody isn't paying their payment, their monthly payment plan. But also, importantly, these things need to work because you're not going to pay for it if it's not working. Um, and they're in far-reaching remote places, so maintenance is really expensive. Roads are rough. Um, communities are very distributed. They're very small communities, so you can't necessarily have hundreds of thousands of support staff on the ground to fix products or to retrieve products if they're broken. So there's a very real pain point emerging in these markets or has emerged in these markets that depend on the sort of technology that we are all getting very excited about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about us. Um, we started, we didn't exactly start with an articulation of a vision <laughs> for longer and healthier lives, but we did start with a curiosity around batteries in particular. How could we extend the life of batteries and what can we understand about how a battery performs according to how it's being used? So that was the kind of original question around where we emerged from. And that started as a um, partnership with Oxford University to explore that question. So Oxford's power and engineering team and machine learning teams have been doing quite a lot of work on battery life and extending battery life. Um, so we set out with that as a, as a question. And this is the articulation of where that's ended up. So we're setting out um, to extend the lives of products, longer and healthier lives for powered products, in the context of where we've been historically um, with our economy. Uh, so our hypothesis is that um, by having access to intelligence on these products, people can make much smarter decisions about this product. So putting, uh, connecting products and having data from products is no good if people aren't obviously responding to it. So it's actually about the decision-making around product. Is that product fit for purpose? Does it work? Should it even ship? Have I designed it right? Is it designed for overcapacity? Is there any reuse potential in it? All of those things result in better performing products, which is the work that Oxford University were looking at, specifically around batteries. Um, much less waste in the supply chain, which feeds into this circular economy, uh, supply chain uh, type thinking. And then... Um, an ongoing, a shift in business model that shifts from a kind of one-time product sale and make, sell, dispose business model to a long-term relationship with customer where in the end what you're pro providing is access to something. And in that continuous connection to, um, to the product and within that business model, there's an ongoing connection to the customer. So there's much greater ability to understand that customer within that type of business model. Um, and BeeBox is our customer, so we'll get to that in a minute. So how do we make money? What's our business model? How do we turn that into a business? We sell um, actionable product intelligence as a low-cost monthly per unit service. So we charge a very small fee for each battery because our, our uh, target market at the moment is batteries. It's not going to be forever, but that's where we focus because that's where we started. So each battery that connects to our service and sends us data and that we analyse, we sell that analysis that insight back to our customers who are typically manufacturers and distributors of these types of products. 
um, so we can assess the health of the product. We, what we won, the, the IoT Launchpad uh, grant funding is helping us to work on an algorithm that will not only assess the current state of health of the product, but to predict in advance when that product will be coming to the end of its life, or to know in advance that that product's getting into trouble. So very much a kind of predictive service. Um, you can manage and control products, so in the context of batteries, you can reduce power from the battery or, or um, completely turn it off effectively. Um, and you can, as I said before, learn how those products are being used to inform all sorts of different things, product de design in one hand, and the other hand, if you know a product's coming towards at the end of its life or it's failing, there's an opportunity to replace that product, retrieve the asset, recycle or reuse, and then upsell. Um, next slide. Uh, this is how it works, kind of. <laughs> um, well, no, it does. I just mean it doesn't work like this for every product we monitor. But um, so we um, we like to think that we didn't need to get involved in hardware, but we have gotten involved with hardware. So we've developed, developed something called our monitoring kit. Uh, and in the context of battery, that's a battery sensor that monitors voltage, current, and temperature data, and a communication hub that processes that data locally and then when there's a connection, sends that data to our service. Um, we have a developer API that Emika will talk about a little bit more. And then the product intelligence, which is what we sell. And you can either access that or, or both actually via our dashboard interface or our API. So some of our customers want to integrate that with their CRM. Other customers want to see it visualized and access it via a dashboard interface. And then we have an alerts and notifications service so you can set up and configure your own alerts on that battery. I want to know when that battery's uh, not being charged, as example. Um, and the idea of the alerts is that you're kind of preventing misuse, if you like. Um, next slide. Uh, so our market opportunity, we started in the um, small-scale distributed energy market in developing economies. We're still very much focused there. We're just doing um, another piece of grant funding application to do a large research trial with a number of those um, manufacturers and distributors in that market. Um, so that's, we hope to grow as that market grows. It's 1.3 billion people without access to um, power. So that's quite a significant market opportunity. But we've also realized there's a much wider opportunity for um, lead acid and lithium ion battery use, and that could be around backup power. So we've learned that pretty much every ATM has a battery behind it. Um, tel telco towers have ba backup battery power. Um, batteries are used in the traction market, which could be um, forklift trucks and all sorts of different mobility solutions. Um, so we are... Um, I think we have our first proposal in with a, a battery manufacturer. So yep. we're just entering this wider battery market, which is quite exciting and takes us to developing and developing economies. I think this is your turn. Oh, that's my turn. <laughs> there you go. So uh, we're still in the case study of uh, our main customer, uh, who is B-Box. And what is B-Box? Uh, the cell, what we call a solar home system. And I don't know mm -hmm. how many of you are familiar with this kind of system. It's basically a box containing a battery, and then you have a solar panel, you know, some kind of low consumption lights, LED lights, maybe a small radio. It's all DC current. And uh, what they do is they sell the system to uh, remote communities. You, know, you have to imagine, I mean, when you don't have a um, uh, light, uh, electricity connection, what people use is usually a kerosene light, and they pay something around $10 a month to get to, to fuel that light. And uh, first, the light is not very good. You know, if you have to study with that light, it, it's, not, it's not good for you. And the fumes also are very bad. Um, and then the challenge is, how do you, do you sell this kind of product to a community that normally cannot really buy this, uh, pay the cost upfront? Okay. So what does B-Box um, uh, succeeded to to sell the product through uh, financing systems. That means the people will pay in three years, and in fact, they will pay every month the same amount of money that they would pay for kerosene. But they get a good light, uh, they can reuse it, uh, they can have a radio, uh, they can charge a mobile phone. Because funnily enough, I mean, there is no uh, electricity, but uh, there is a good mobile phone coverage. Uh, so you have the phone, but sometimes you don't know how to charge it. So um, we started 
collaborating with this company, I think, two right. years ago. Right, well, right from the beginning, right from right, the early yeah, days. Right, right from the early days. So to entice them to, to, to use a remote connection for them in the system and kind of open new business model uh, for the company. Um, how, how do we help them? I mean, th there are problems. Um, battery fail. I mean, they, they use lead acid batteries, they have a certain shelf life, and also they are really dependent on the temperature. So um, when they spend too much time in the container when crossing from China to the country, it's taking really too long in the, in the warehouse. I mean, the, the battery is not really in good shape. Also, as mentioned, they depend on financing to get the business running. And have you seen, also, there are really remote areas, so it takes time, I mean, for experience, it takes really a long time. If you need to fix something, it's not as if we're going, you know, to the new corner shop. It takes sometimes hours to just uh, fix something. Uh, and also, how do they understand the customer? I mean, there is no much historic data about the customer. So, we try to help them with that. So first, we kind of convince them to have the remote uh, system in the, in the box. And we help them design it. And we help them design <laughs> it. Um, and now we provide, I mean, our, our business is to provide uh, this service, this analytic service. And uh, so we provide battery capacity, uh, which, funnily enough, is something quite hard to do, uh, to really know at uh, any point of time what is the, the capacity of your battery. Um, we provide some user segmentation, that means if you see how someone use uh, a product, you start to know uh, a little more about that person. So we, that helps. Uh, we also provide anomaly detection, and that will help uh, really the financing. So one of the questions is, okay, this customer, is it using the system properly? I mean, is my device in danger to be destroyed? Uh, when you look at the financing of this kind of product and the people bring the money, they want to be sure that it's like for a house, you know. Uh, they want to be sure that your asset is uh, in good hand and it's what happens. So people will not give you, lend you the money, uh, the VC will not give you the money if they cannot have a kind of a guarantee, they have a link to the product that the, the, the finance. Um, maintenance is remote area, I mean a big problem exactly is to send the right person at the right time. Um, maybe to group different round of maintenance if needed. Uh, so for that we provide alerts and those you can see on the dashboard, okay, maybe you should take a look over there and maybe you can fix something. And also it gives you some information about the, the state of the system. So instead of having to go there to check that maybe um, something is unplugged, uh, you can directly see it from, from distance. Um, and then again, for understanding the customer, the user segmentation. So all that is kind of, we, we provide a, a layer of insight on top of the raw data that we receive from them. So as Tamar mentioned, we measure just voltage, uh, current and temperature. That's what, what we collect. Um, we, we have some guidelines on how much data you need to send. It's a, it, I mean it's a GSM connection. Uh, it's not always really reliable. Uh, so you want to send the minimum data to be able to do your job. So that's kind of the service that we provide. We tell to the companies, okay, uh, we tell them how much data they need to send us, what is the, the, the precision, the number of bits, um, etc., to be able to do your job. But still, when you see current voltage temperature, it doesn't give you much information. For example, that's uh, what you see on our dashboard. Uh, that's really a, a snapshot of a, of a product. Uh, you see uh, on the left is just a list of selected devices. And that's raw data, voltage, <coughs> current, temperature. And the question is, okay, uh, where is the dead battery? And that's only 12 products. Is uh, Maybe if you're a battery specialist, uh, a lead acid battery specialist will say, oh, it's that one. Mm. But it's not easy. It's not easy because we measure battery capacity, which is not state of charge. So the battery will charge up, up to this top voltage. You know, it's like when you have a small battery and then you put it in your uh, cycle light, it bright for five seconds and then it goes on really quickly. So it's the same. I mean, when you look at the, the signal, it goes from top to bottom. But in here, there is a, uh, there is a dead battery. Okay. I think it's much easier here in the bottom. You see where is the dead battery. 
So it's exactly what we do. We kind of distill the data. Um, it's kind of three different houses here. A kind of raw battery capacity estimation, which really gives you the capacity that at any point of time after it is charged. Then, I mean, it's quite noisy because it depends on the temperature, it depends on wh what kind of device you have plugged in your, in your box. Uh, and then, again, there is another pass on the data. And then that's data that, can really, that are really actionable. So on that one, you can create an alert, for example. It would be very difficult to create an alert on the first data, obviously, mm -hmm. but even on the first capacity, it's quite difficult. It's too, it's too nice. And here, at the end, you, you get really what, what we're set up to, to work on and to deliver. It's really uh, something that you can see visually that gives you the value and then you can work. So that's what we do. That's what we do. Um, we draw pretty pictures. <laughs> we draw pretty pictures, and uh, I don't see well co uh, color, so someone else chose the color. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really, at the end, uh, a lot of people talk about IoT. Um, there is this excitement of uh, connecting product, uh, but uh, we, we need to think what do we want to do with that? Yeah. What do we want to do? Um, do I really want my wash to talk to my fridge? Maybe yes, maybe not. Um, or my washing machine. Um, uh, washing machine, maybe. But here, I think we, we deliver really a value to the company because using that, that solve many problems. And I think we have a, the right impact. That's it. Okay, thank you.